Tonight on To The Point. 45% reduction in the number of chronically homeless people. New homelessness numbers suggest the crisis is improving in Sacramento, while advocates warn the numbers are misleading. Plus, the Supreme Court could soon decide a case impacting how local governments address homelessness. What could change? Tracking the tail end of this first stretch of 100 degree heat, how long it will last, and what we see with the cooling in the forecast. And later, cleanup underway at another California college campus. Protesters barricade themselves inside a building. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on To The Point. I'm Becca Habiger. Alex Bell has the night off. Right now, an excessive heat warning is in effect across the Central Valley. So let's get right over to Chief Meteorologist Monica Woods with the latest conditions. We are tracking that excessive heat. Second day in a row that we've had these 100s. Today, even warmer than yesterday. As you can see, 103 for Marysville and Stockton. 80 for San Francisco. It's been really tough to find a place that's a little bit on the cooler side, and we're still close to 100 up and down the valley. 90s for the foothills, 80s for the Sierra, and near 70 for the coast. With that excessive heat warning still in place through tomorrow evening at 8 p.m., we'll continue to track heat illnesses as well as outdoor activities being impacted and our fire danger as well. Speaking of that, we have a few thunderstorms popping up in the Sierra. Anytime we see lightning and this kind of heat and the drying conditions that we're heading into, it does cause some concern, but we should be okay for tonight. As far as those conditions, tonight's lows near 70, excessive heat back for tomorrow. And developing tonight in Napa County, Cal Fire is battling a fire in St. Helena. It's called the Crystal Fire. Right now, crews say the fire is burning toward the Bell Canyon Reservoir and threatening structures. At last check, Cal Fire says it has burned 60 acres and is 50% contained. Tonight, is Sacramento's homelessness crisis getting better? Well, it depends on who you ask. The 2024 point in time count numbers released today suggest there has been a 29% drop in the homeless population since 2022. Now that report helps federal, state and local officials make decisions about how to allocate resources to better address homelessness. The to the point team was part of the count back in February. And tonight, ABC 10's Jeannie Nguyen is breaking down the numbers. And Jeannie, why some advocates don't necessarily believe them? Well, Becca, even though county and city officials say today that these numbers are good news, it's still not a time to celebrate because the homelessness issue still needs to be fixed. However, advocates tell me these numbers can be misleading and don't address the real issues at hand. Today is not a declaration of victory. It represents significant progress. Sacramento has seen a 29% decrease in homelessness since 2022. This comes after Sacramento City and county officials announced the new point in time or pit count results. The pit count tracks unsheltered people who live in places like cars, parks, sidewalks, and abandoned buildings. When you combine that with truly increased capacity, increased performance, increased funding, increased coordination, it really does point to a decrease. On top of an overall decline, Mayor Daryl Steinberg notes the increase in housing over the last four years. An 84% increase since 2020 in the number of sheltered, shelter and traditional housing beds in the city and county from 1,611 to 3,000 527 and noting a significant decrease in those that are chronically homeless 45 percent reduction in the number of chronically homeless people since 2022 while the city and county are pleased to see these results advocates with the sacramento regional coalition to end homelessness say this shouldn't be celebrated this is tied to uh, another uh, piece of the report where 72 percent of respondents said that they had been moved by law enforcement in the two months prior to the count. Adding that this new report could be unreliable. The scattering of people across the city and county through forced displacement uh, means that people are going unseen and uncounted. Officials with Loaves and Fishes say they don't have data to support the pit counts report and have seen a 6.4% increase in guests served and a 20.5% increase in meals served. What I saw in the data was that it said 58% of people had uh, been homeless for 36 months or more. Um, and that speaks to me of people languishing in homelessness rather than getting a pathway out.
Some good different perspectives there. Now, Jeannie, during today's announcement, Mayor Daryl Steinberg had some choice words for business owners who say that the homelessness crisis is affecting their bottom line. Yeah, Becca, well, he was very stern in his messaging to business owners today and essentially told them to stop complaining. Take a listen. It is not a good thing for the city or and especially civic leaders and the business leadership are civic leaders to constantly be tearing down the city and the county. It's not a good thing. Now, we did reach out to a few organizations representing business owners, including the California Retailers Association. A spokesperson for them would not do an interview with me or provide me with a comment. All right, Jeannie, thank you very much. And while the report shows Sacramento County's unincorporated areas and the city of Sacramento saw a decrease, that's not the same for all cities within the county. Take a look. This map shows the estimated percentage difference of the unsheltered population compared to 2022. Now, Folsom shows the largest increase, 565% compared to two years ago. Elk Grove is also up about 84%. Now, Rancho Cordova and Citrus Heights saw their unsheltered populations decrease by roughly 67% and 30%. Experts we spoke to say it is unclear whether a declining population in one part of the county led to an increase in another. Now, a U.S. Supreme Court decision has the potential to change how local and state governments address the homelessness crisis. Currently, a federal court decision bans Western states from fining or arresting people for sleeping or camping on public property. The case before the Supreme Court challenges that ban, and the decision could come as soon as tomorrow. I spoke with an expert about what it could mean. Arresting or fining people for sleeping or camping on public property when they have nowhere else to go, that is, when the city or county where they live doesn't have a shelter bed for them, amounts to cruel and unusual punishment, a violation of the Eighth Amendment. That's according to two decisions by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Martin v. Boise in 2018 and Grants Pass v. Johnson in 2022. Back in April, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a case asking to overturn this precedent with people like Governor Gavin Newsom saying it ties the hands of local and state leaders when it comes to addressing homelessness. The impediments under Grants Pass uh, and the courts have imposed, it's a real issue. On the other side, people experiencing homelessness and their advocates tell ABC 10 overturning the precedent would amount to criminalizing homelessness itself. They can't move people in public spaces without adequate shelter. We don't have shelter. We have a wait list here in Sacramento of over 2,500 people. With the Supreme Court's decision due any day now, I asked Ron Hochbaum about possible outcomes. He teaches at University of the Pacific's McGeorge School of Law and runs the Homeless Advocacy Clinic there. During oral arguments, we did see questions from conservative justices like Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh acknowledging that there aren't enough shelter beds or affordable housing for everyone experiencing homelessness. However, how the court will incorporate that reality into its decision is really unknown. If the court upholds the ban, he says, California and other states may be incentivized to focus on providing the necessary housing to get people off of the streets. But if the court overturns that ban, then laws that prohibit sleeping on public property could become enforceable once again. When these laws are enforced, they drive people deeper into homelessness because the income people have for rent is redirected towards paying off criminal fines and fees. And the U.S. Supreme Court will issue decisions for various cases every Thursday morning this month. So we could get a decision on the Grants Pass case tomorrow or as late as June 27th. Now, in other news tonight, fire officials say a woman was killed this morning in a fire in Rancho Cordova. It happened just after 4 a.m. on Mills Station Road. Firefighters say they found the woman unresponsive. She was taken to the hospital where she later died. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Fairfield police are searching for a man who allegedly attempted to assault two children while they were walking to school this morning. Officers say two 12 year olds were walking along a bike path between Meadowlark Drive and East Tabor Avenue when a man riding a BMX style bike tried to assault them. Police say the man was wearing a brown shirt and blue jeans. Anyone with information should call Fairfield police. Still ahead on to the point cleanup is underway at another California college campus after protesters barricaded themselves in a building. Well, we are tracking one of the hottest days of the year so far, and now we're starting to see that cooling trend, how long it lasts.
Chief Meteorologist Monica Woods joins us now. Mm -hmm. Monica, some dangerous heat out there today. Certainly was. Yeah, hottest day of the year so far. And we got one more day of these types of conditions. That's why this excessive heat warning continues until 8 o'clock tomorrow night. We'll be tracking all the impacts with that. And also for the coast, where we've got this heat advisory in place. Now, not along the immediate coast, but just inland. We're still going to be seeing those highs in the 90s to near 100 tomorrow afternoon. Today, as you can see, we bumped up just one degree. That was enough to make it the hottest day of the year so far. And it was a quick jump up Monday. We had 80s, and then we got those winds picking up on Tuesday, and that bumped us into the 100s. Tomorrow, last day of the excessive heat, fire danger is still elevated. Now, even when we start cooling, we'll still be above average, and then early next week, we're right back to near 100. This is a look out at those Sierra storms. You can see those thunderclouds overhead here and the dried out brown grass in the valley where we have some of that higher fire danger. Up top with the lightning strikes, we'll track that, but we've got some wetting rain and also some pretty moist ground. That's not to say we couldn't see one of those lightning spark fires, but it looks a little less likely at this point in the season. High pressure ridge starts to move out, and with that, we'll get access to that light breeze for tomorrow. Highs in the 80s for this year, tomorrow afternoon, 90s to near 100 down the hill. As we move close, closer to the coast, you'll certainly see the impacts of that onshore flow developing. Highs drop to the 60s along the immediate coastline, and then we're still in the 80s and 90s as we start to head inland. By the time we get to the valley, we're still going to be seeing those 100s farther from that breeze. But for those of us that have access to that breeze, highs will be in the upper 90s to near 100. A look at the five day regional forecast for the mountains. We'll see cooling conditions over the weekend dropping into the 70s, 80s expected by Saturday and Sunday in the foothills. But tomorrow still quite warm, especially for the morning, starting off in the mid 70s for the foothills. And again, for the coast, we're already feeling the cooling starting tomorrow. We'll see that expand throughout the valley by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's still going to be putting us above average right back near 100 early next week. And then we drop back into the 90s, Becca. Monica, thank you so much. And of course, you can stay up to date with the weather conditions in your neighborhood with our free ABC 10 app. There you can also find information on cooling centers and how to avoid heat-related illnesses. Now, coming up on To The Point, testimony begins in Hunter Biden's felony gun trial, what his ex-wife and girlfriend are saying about his drug addiction. Plus, a dozen people arrested during another California campus protest, the destruction left behind. Tonight, in the ongoing college campus protests, more than a dozen people were arrested on Stanford's campus today after law enforcement removed pro-Palestinian demonstrators from an area that houses the university president and provost offices. School officials say there was damage inside and outside the building, and an officer was hurt after being shoved by protesters. The encampment had been there since late April. A spokesperson for the camp claims the people who were arrested were not part of the campus vandalism. They basically have maintained that they're entirely separate from any like more formalized body of pro-Palestine student organizing on campus, whether it be an organizing body, whether it be an encampment. The university says it removed the encampment in the interest of public safety, saying in a statement, the situation on campus has now crossed the line from peaceful protest to actions that threaten the safety of our community. Today in the felony gun trial against Hunter Biden, prosecutors called more witnesses to the stand, including several women from Hunter's past. Rena Roy has more tonight on what jurors heard during testimony. Prosecutors calling multiple witnesses to the stand in their case against Hunter Biden as they try to prove to jurors that he illegally purchased a Colt revolver in October of 2018 while he was allegedly addicted to drugs and lied about his addiction on a federal form. Ex-wife Kathleen Buell telling jurors about their 25-year marriage, which ended in 2017. She says their relationship deteriorated because of his drug and alcohol addiction. She testified that when he was on drugs, he was not himself, angry, short-tempered, acting in ways he wouldn't when he was sober. But on cross-examination, telling the defense that she never saw him use drugs. An ex-girlfriend of Hunter's then testifying that she met him in late 2017. 
and saw him use crack every 20 minutes or so over the course of their months-long relationship as late as September 20th of 2018. Whether Hunter was an addict at the time of the gun purchase is the critical question in this case. Defense lawyer Abby Lowell told jurors evidence will show he was using alcohol at that time but not drugs and that the form was confusing. They say he had just gotten out of a 12-day rehab program before purchasing the gun. The gun shop employee who sold Hunter Biden the revolver also taking the stand, saying he was about two feet away from Hunter when he filled out that federal form, testifying that he didn't seem to express any confusion by the question that asked about drug use. Prosecutors also showing the jury the gun he bought. On cross-examination, an FBI agent testifying that several photos prosecutors showed the jury of drug substances and what appeared to be a crack pipe were taken months after the gun purchase. Testimony is expected to continue tomorrow. The trial could last about two weeks. Dozens of migrants continued their journey across the U.S. border today in California, despite new restrictions announced by President Joe Biden on Tuesday. The new rules say those caught illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border could be denied the chance to claim asylum and swiftly deported or turned back to Mexico. The measures, which took effect immediately, include exemptions for exceptions for unaccompanied children and people facing serious medical or safety threats. The new restrictions are expected to trigger legal challenges from immigrant and civil rights groups, which have criticized Biden for adopting Trump-like policies and backtracking on U.S. legal obligations to asylum seekers. The ruling has also brought up a lot of questions about how the federal government and humanitarian organizations are helping migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. So Ariane Dettiel with our National Verify team looked into a claim that the United Nations gives cash to migrants entering the U.S. from Mexico. Multiple social posts claim the United Nations is giving out millions of dollars in cash to migrants trying to cross the southern border. Some of the posts suggest the U.N. is using U.S. tax dollars to help migrants enter the country. So let's verify. Does the United Nations give cash to migrants entering the U.S. from Mexico? These are our sources. There are two U.N. agencies that provide funding for migrants, the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, and the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees. The U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees has a program for vulnerable migrants who choose to stay and seek asylum in Mexico. The agency says it does not provide any individual cash assistance to migrants who intend to enter the U.S. at the southern border. And until February of this year, the IOM ran a temporary assistance program for vulnerable migrant populations in Mexico that provided three months of assistance through secure electronic wallets, which resembled debit cards. The recipients could only use the money in Mexico for certain purchases, including food, medicine, clothing, or other essential items. In 2023, the program assisted 1,573 people. So what about the claim that the UN is using U.S. tax dollars to help migrants enter the country via the U.S.-Mexico border? Verify reached out to the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, which helps fund the UN's short-term monetary assistance programs in Mexico. It is true. The United States has provided millions in funding to the UN, and it is the organization's biggest contributor. But the Department of State also confirmed what the UN told us. These assistance programs are only for families staying in Mexico while they await a decision from Mexico's refugee agency on their case. The Department of State added that this money is meant to help families safely stay where they are and not fall prey to smuggling organizations. So we can verify, no. The United Nations does not give cash to migrants entering the U.S. from Mexico. With your Verify, I'm Ariane Day Till. Let's get into your price point now. Folsom is considering using $1.1 million of its emergency reserve funds to make renovations to a popular park. The money would be used to renovate the Kids Play Park, also known as Castle Park on Pruitt Drive. The city manager says despite many years of maintenance, the city has reached a point where it removes key components once they wear out. The council will consider the complete budget proposal, including the park renovation portion, at its June 11th meeting. After closing dozens of locations in California, Rubio's Coastal Grill has officially filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The company says it's taking this action to facilitate the sale of the business. The company says the decision comes after the business was negatively impacted by remote working, the rising cost of food, utilities, and increases to California's minimum wage. Next, on to the point, improving response times. The new tech at one local fire department helping them get to your calls faster.
Check this out. The Consumptus River Fire, or the Consumptus Fire Department is now using a program that turns signal lights green for fire engines and ambulances driving to emergencies. The system recognizes where those vehicles are and will turn the light green in their direction of travel so other drivers can get out of the way, clearing the intersection before the emergency responders get there. Imagine a busy, congested intersection somewhere in the city of Elk Grove. Uh, for example, um, Auto Mall and Elk Grove Boulevard. If you're stopped at that intersection at a red light, there's nowhere for you to go. And there's no way for the fire engine or ambulance to go around. The fire department will be trying out the program on major roads for the next year. Well, thank you so much for watching and inviting us into your home. If you have something you think we should be looking into, please shoot the team an email at to the point at abc10.com. Hey, we're off tomorrow because of the NBA finals, but we'll see you on Friday. Have a great night and stay cool. Hey, it's Alex. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching the To The Point team and I love hearing from you and I hope that you'll stay in touch. And don't forget, you can always email me and the team at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send us a text message at 916-321-3310.